So today, I promised to, uh, last week we covered the, some of the tr atrocities that have been uh, visited upon mankind because of uh, the, the, the idea of evolution, which when taken to its logical extension, uh, led to uh, eugenics, led to race, uh, scientific, what I call scientific racism, where the Nazis claimed that they were a superior race of, of humans and they were trying to breed that race and exterminate the less desirable people. This week we're going to delve in just to maybe a, put our toe in the water of uh, a little bit more scientific uh, problems. And, and this week I'm dealing with the, the harm that evolution has caused uh, to the medical profession and by extension to human beings. So um, at the bottom I have Psalm 139.13, For you created my innermost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that picture is, uh, is a rendering of what the DNA molecule looks like. That DNA is in almost every cell of your body. Uh, it's uh, the code that instructs how that cell should work, what it should perform. So you start off as a single cell, a fertilized egg in your mother's womb, each and every one of us. That one cell has all of the information to make all of the other 100 trillion cells that are in your body today. So this is the code, I call it the code of life, and it might be, the, you know, God's signature. He put that in us, and it's so complex, uh, and they're still understanding, trying to understand uh, how it works. Helps if I turn it on. Okay, and, and, and I, like, uh, I like this uh, slide on the left. It says, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It is the illusion of knowledge. And I think that's, that's where we are today. We have a grand illusion of knowledge. We have all these scientific bodies all over the world. We have all of these great scientists that are pontificating about how things are working. But they are often, uh, and I would claim, they are, they are substantially wrong. And you think of the past, so we revere people like Aristotle, a Greek philosopher that, that, that changed history with the way he thought. He believed that life came about spontaneously. He believed if you put a jar of meat outside and left it, come back a few days later, it's covered with you know insects and crawling things. He didn't understand that those were coming from the outside. And it took until Louis Pasteur in the in the uh, his his experiments, where he actually proved that it, it, life only comes from life, and in fact that's in the high school textbooks, but they still teach evolution. If life only comes from life, where did the first life come from? So it's a logical problem. So Aristotle and then uh, other great thinkers, you know, uh, there's a fellow in Alexandria, Egypt, called Ptolemy, and he thought the Earth was the center. Of, this, of the solar system and the sun and the moon and all of the planets revolved around Earth. And so that was proved wrong. So time after time after time, these great names in history, the ones we call scientists, they were wrong. We're human, right? Nobody's perfect. I, I heard that somewhere. It's in the Bible. Oh, not one. So let's get on with it. We're going, mission is always the same, exalt Jesus Christ. We want to teach the Bible. We want to equip you, the saints, to go out and tell the world. So if you could play the first video. This is an overview of DNA. It's a little short video, and I think that will kind of bring you up to speed of what you need to know for the rest of the talk. Stated Clearly presents, what is DNA and how does it work? DNA, also known as deoxyribonucleic acid, is a molecule. It's a bunch of atoms stuck together. In the case of DNA, these atoms combine to form the shape of a long, spiraling ladder, sort of like this one here. If you ever studied biology or saw the movie Jurassic Park, you probably heard that DNA acts as a blueprint or a recipe for a living thing. 
But how? How on earth can a mere molecule act as a blueprint for something as complex and wonderful as a tree, a dog, or a dinosaur? To help answer that question, let's first take a quick look at amino acids. Amino acids are tiny little chemicals inside our bodies that are so important, they're often referred to as the building blocks of life. There's about 20 different kinds, each with their own unique shape. The neat thing about them is they can be attached to each other, kind of like Legos, to produce an endless variety of larger particles known as proteins. Amino acids make up proteins. Proteins, along with other chemicals, combine to form living cells. Cells make up tissues. Tissues make up organs. And organs, when they're all put together and functioning, of course, combine to form living creatures like you and me. These proteins that make up our bodies and Keep in mind, there's millions of different kinds of proteins. They each have to be formed in the perfect shape in order to function. If they're the wrong shape, they usually won't work. That's where DNA comes in. DNA does a lot of interesting things, some of which we don't fully understand, but one of its main and most well understood functions is to tell amino acids how to line up and form themselves into the perfect protein shapes. In theory, if the right proteins are built at the right time and in the right place, everything else from cells to organs to entire creatures will come out just fine. <coughs> this here is a simplified model of DNA. It shows us that the steps of the ladder are made up of four different kinds of chemicals shown here by different colors and letters. If you look at just one half of the molecule, you can read its chemical sequence or genetic code from top to bottom, sort of like a book. A single strand of DNA is extremely long, millions of letters long. It spends most of its life coiled up like a noodle, living inside the nucleus or the centerpiece of a cell. Amino acids, however, live outside the nucleus in what's called the cytoplasm. To help DNA interact with the cytoplasm and convert those amino acids into proteins, Special chemicals inside the nucleus make partial copies of the DNA code. These partial copies, called RNA, look a lot like DNA, but they're shorter, of course, and they're missing one of their sides. Their small shape and size allows them to fit through tiny pores in the nucleus, out to the cytoplasm, and into the mouth of another particle called a ribosome. Ribosomes are protein-building machines. They read the RNA code three letters at a time, suck amino acids out of their surroundings and stick them together in a chain according to the RNA code. As the chain grows, it bends, it folds, and it sticks to itself to form a perfectly shaped protein. Every three letters of the RNA code tell the ribosome which of the 20 different kinds of amino acids should be added next. For example, CAA tells the ribosome to grab a glutamine. AGU tells it to grab a serine, and so on. Once a protein is built, it can then go on to do a number of different things, one of which could be to help form a brand new cell. So to answer the original question, what is DNA? DNA is a molecular blueprint for a living thing. How does it work? DNA creates RNA, RNA creates protein, Proteins go on to form life. This entire process, as complicated, as sophisticated, as magical as it might seem, is entirely based in chemistry. It can be studied. It can be understood. I'm John Perry, and that's DNA Stated Clearly. Okay, so DNA controls the appearance, the body type, what, how we, what we pass on to our kids. That's why you go into the medical office and you fill out this long form. What are the diseases your family had, your uncles, your aunts, your, your mom and dad? And many of the diseases in humans are a result of DNA. There's some hereditary, um, you know, I know Angelina Jolie found that she, her family and her DNA had a propensity for uh, breast cancer. So she actually had a double mastectomy without having any breast cancer found because she didn't want to take that chance. So as medicine is developing, we're going from a case where 
it's the go to the doctor, take these two aspirins and see me in the morning, uh, to we're going to design a drug that matches your, your DNA so that it is more effective at curing you. So it's designer drugs that match exactly what your DNA problems are. So this is just a review of what was happening. Remember that there's those four different amino acids, A, A, C, T, and G. They're put together in the, in the helix form, and the, the, um, the A's go with the T's, and the C's go with the G's, and God designed it so there can be that uh, air prevention, so the coating is so it doesn't create errors and mutations, and genius, you know, brilliant idea. And so these, this is the way that your cells get copied, and you're essentially a new person every 40 years. Every cell in your body has been replaced, died, and been consumed and replaced with another cell in 40 years. And it's kind of interesting when you look at how the DNA wraps itself around. If you start at the top, you see this strand of DNA, and it's coiling. And then it wraps around these things called histones. They look, they're like little uh, balls of yarn. And then those balls of yarn all wind into a shape. And that shape is usually an X or a Y kind of a shape. And that's called a chromosome. So that has the, that has the information. And those chromosomes, those little X-shaped things, are like knots on a, on a yarn. If you have yarn and you tie a knot and then go a little further and tie another knot. So it's one long strand with the chromosomes, but the chromosomes are every so, so often. And when you see those knots, you think, for you were created, innermost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. That's like knitting something together. And here's just a picture of, uh, so the chromosomes are made up of areas there. They've color coded them silver, red, and yellow. And those are portions of DNA. And in those portions, we call genes. So you have a gene for your eye color and gene for your hair color. And then those genes, when you look at it, are those strings of ACTs and Gs paired up one against the other. And there's a highly magnified uh, picture of a human uh, uh, chrom a set of chromosomes. You can't see the little string of DNA that goes between each one of those chromosomes, but you know, basically there, there's your whole instruction set for your, your life. So we have to get into some of the, the timing. So I have to relate. How, how is this harmful? So in, in the 1970s, they were able to sequence uh, DNA for uh, a single cell creature, say amoeba or protozoan. And so they knew that had about one million of these basis pairs. There were one million of those pairs that give the instruction on how to make the amoeba. And then as time went on, that was in the 70s, and it took them until the early 2000s to get the full human genome, the 3.2 billion letters, and they published that in a set of books, and it's just an endless set of A, C, T, G, G, A, T, C, just on and on and on, 3.2 billion times. And w within your DNA, there is 46 regions called the chromosomes, and then within those chromosomes, there's about 20 thousand genes and as, as the video showed you that's made up of amino acids so you can see kind of the building block structure of how this is going on and here's a guy famous atheist from uh, Australia his name is Paul uh, Davies and he said how did the atoms stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software how did they write that nobody knows there's no lone law of physics able to create information from nothing and yet he, he believes in evolution. So time after time, there's people when they are conferences or they let their hair down after maybe a glass of wine in the bar or something, they'll say something like that. This he published in one of, you know, this is a published, this isn't a, a bar comment. But he published that and, and he believes that and it's the truth. So really, the complexity of the genome is beyond our, our wildest imagination. You see those, that string of letters of A, C, T, and G, and that movie showed the RNA goes in and make copy of those genes. But when they, so if we did that, we'd say, okay, here's a bunch of letters. You go in and you write down the letters, and you take that, and you push that through the cell wall and let it go to the ribosome, and the ribosome makes the protein. No, 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 no. 
the way it's read, is it reads a little piece and then it skips something and it reads and then it reads forwards and it reads backwards. So they're finding it's not a simple process. It's a tremendously complex process. So what would you expect from an infinite God? Infinite complexity. So I believe, as we're told uh, by Paul, the evidence of God, we are without excuse, told us in Romans. You know, it's clearly, clearly seen in all of nature. You don't have to have a, a microscope. You don't have to know DNA. All you have to do is watch a bird flying or you, you watch an insect crawling or ants working together to build a, a society on the ground. You don't need to have a scientific degree. And of course, we start with one cell and we come out with a precious baby, the blessing from the Lord. So I ask you a question, you know, which one fits? You know, we've got reality, that's that round hole there, and we got two explanations. We got evolution and we got creation. So I deeply believe that creation is the explanation. So let's get on to the, to the focus of why I'm talking about this. So in, as people were thinking about DNA and they were thinking about evolution, they thought, well, you know, if we evolved from that amoeba and we evolved up through all these different stages to get to it, um, maybe there's some leftover DNA from the amoeba that's in us that really doesn't do anything. It was just left over from our evolution. And then, you know, we uh, turned into a fish and we got some fish DNA and, and toad, you know, amphibian DNA and then, you know, what ape DNA. So we got all these leftover things that don't work because we're not any of, of those creatures. So they came up with the term junk DNA. So all of this DNA that is non-active, doesn't really do anything, is just leftover junk. And in the 70s, that term, after they had sequenced the, the amoeba and, and they thought and they knew the, the they didn't know the exact uh, code of the humans, but they knew how much more complex it was. So they, they made the claim that all of the non-coding, all of the DNA that didn't produce proteins, it was worthless. So they co coined this phrase junk. DNA. And it, recently it's become apparent that the majority of non-coding DNA in large genomes actually serves a vital purpose to a cell. But they didn't know that in their arrogance. So here's a plot. And on the left-hand side, starting with the amoeba, there's increasing complexity in all of the different animals that you see and they've all looked at the genes of each one, or the DNA of each one of those creatures so if you pick out a few of them you start with a single cell creature that was the first life that came about and then you evolve and you find a worm so that creature eventually after millions of years turned into a worm and then then millions of years later it, it became a fish and so the worm has a hundred million basis pairs the the single cell creature only has one million. So the worm is a hundred times more complex. And then you go to a fish, the, the worm turned into a fish, and now that's a billion basis pairs. So it has a billion uh, ladder steps in its DNA. And then humans, we have about 3.2 billion basis pairs, but we can't be too arrogant because flowering plants have even 30 times more <laughs> DNA than we do. So, you know, a rose is more complex than we are. So that's the evolution, and that's their thought process, is you're going from the amoeba down to the human, all this junk DNA. So let me jump. So this is an ENCODE project. So in the middle of 2005, they decided that they were going to really f look very hard at the human genome. And so they contracted 400 PhD scientists, microbiologists, and geneticists from all over the world, Italy, France, Germany, South Africa, United States, China, everywhere. And they worked together in teams for five years, 400 PhD scientists plus support people for five years. And when it was all over in 2012, they published 30 papers. And what was the most important thing they found? 
when they published, they published the research of this in Code Product showed that 80% of the human genome is functional. And they also believe that that the, that eighty percent is what controls and and is and participates in causing hereditary medical problems. So all of that stuff, they started out with two percent. So they thought two percent was coding DNA and ninety eight percent was junk. Now this this giant project over five years, four hundred PhDs, they found out eighty percent was not junk. And they think the other 20% does something, they just don't know what it is. So, and it's been published in, in top um, paper, scientific articles all over the world. This is Nature. Nature is one of the most prestigious scientific journals. And they, they quote, on page 57 is that 80% of the genome uh, uh, is functional, dispatching the widely held view that human genome is mostly junk DNA. So this is published in Nature. This is the most widely read scientific journal of, of the scientists in 2012. I think it was October. So I'll skip over that. That's, that's a listing of all of the functions of the DNA that they found from their research. And it's kind of like you can think of this. So what that, that material does, you can think of an orchestra if everybody just comes in and sits down and starts playing music, it sounds like chaos, right? It's noise. But you have to have music, so the, the people have to be playing the same thing for each of their different instruments. But it's the conductor that tells you when you're supposed to play, you know, when you come in. Yes, George? I'll give you a copy of the slides, you save your... So we go on to the second video, number two. This is called the ENCODE Project. This is a report from the, one of the lead the scientists, and he's going to tell you uh, what happened. A decade ago, scientists broke down the three billion letters in an average human genome. Now they're trying to translate those letters into a comprehensive instruction manual for building a person. This book is the result of the draft human genome. It was a great achievement back in 2000, um, but it's just a set of boring letters, A, C, T, and G, and it goes on for a very long time. And what ENCODE is trying to do is, is bring this to life. These letters actually do something. They mean something. And ENCODE is the project that starts to get at this, starts to try and find some understanding uh, for these letters. The aim of the ENCO project is to characterize all functional elements within the human genome. And the consortium considers functional elements in very broad terms. So these include the genes, as we know them, the elements in the genome that encode proteins, but also all transcripts, so all of the RNA that comes off of the genome. And very importantly, the project aims to characterize the regulatory parts of the, the genome. Sometimes there are elements that switch genes on and off. Sometimes there are elements that pack up bits of DNA in appropriate ways. And there are probably things that we have no idea uh, what they're doing, uh, and yet they're doing something important. The ENCODE project has taken five years. Uh, it's involved uh, hundreds of people, 400 on the main paper, many more across the other papers. Uh, and it's generated hundreds of terabytes of raw data. Now, that's uh, a pretty large amount of data but it's actually staggering not only in its size, but its detail. One of the fundamental things about making a, a creature as complicated as us is that we're made of many, many different types of cells, and those different cells use different parts of the genome. And it's always been a bit mysterious, but what is it that switches things on and off? Now, what ENCODE does for 100-odd, 200, 300 different cell types is start to try and understand why is it your liver cell is different from your kidney cell. And so uh, it's really a first view of that complexity um, that generates a human being. So a striking overall result that the ENCO project reports is that they can assign a function, a biochemical function, to 80% of the human genome. The reason why this is striking is because not such a long time ago we still considered that vast proportion of the human genome was simply junk because of course we know that it's only 3% that encodes proteins. 
it's very hard to get over the density of information. I think previously people thought that the, the, the genome was quite a well-organized place with these, uh, these genes that had um, kind of discrete places and a, and a discrete, quite sedate choreography. Um, but that's just not what the data says. The data, it's like a jungle of, uh, of stuff out there. There are things that we, we thought we understood, and yet it's much, much more complex. And then places of the genome that we thought were completely silent, and they're teeming with life. They're teeming with things going on. We still really don't understand that. But there's this big shift towards, uh, towards this detail and scale. Human genetics has told us quite a bit about where areas, which areas of the genome are associated with human disease. The frustration has been that most of these areas fall in non-coding parts of the genome. These are parts of the genome which we knew until now very little about. And this is exactly where the ENCODE project comes in. You can now work from the ENCODE starting point and ask much more focused questions on precisely why is it that uh, this particular set of genes seem to do something in the liver, uh, what is switching it on and switching it off. And in particular, when it comes to disease, you may in fact not know the cell type that you are interested in. And ENCODE lets you find the cell type that is more associated with your disease. So, you know, I think that, I think that says pretty much how complex everything is. The, the, he was one of the lead uh, scientists, but it's, it's, you can understand, right? It's just the vast complexity and how hard it is, but they found things that are, this part of the gene works with the liver, this part works with the kidney, this is, uh, does something with the heart, this is a uh, brain, <clears throat> so we go on. So remember, this was reported, it was in Nature, the lady that spoke there was one of the senior editors from Nature magazine, 2012. Okay, play the next one. This is 2000, October 2013, one year later. And this is Discovery. This is uh, Discovery News for the young people. Hey guys, it's Trace again for D News. Our DNA might be mostly nothing. Yep, not a zip, just trash. Scientists learned in the 80s that of all DNA, maybe 2% contains actual genes. Genes are the switches that turn on the production of proteins that make us who, how, and what we are. The rest of that 98%, we're not sure what that does. If anything, it might just be junk DNA, or what the scientists call non-coding DNA. Coding DNA connects to RNA, which then goes off and produces cells and determines how they work. But non-coding DNA, well, it's pretty much just chilling out. Since its discovery, scientists have found that this disorganized and mostly mysterious section of our genetic code doesn't really seem to do anything. So why don't we just cut it out? Because we're not entirely sure that it's useless, that's why it just seems to be. Non-coding DNA was discovered when scientists began looking deeper into cloning. They found that only a small percent of our DNA determined a lot about the organism, and now scientists have been working for decades to find out exactly what the heck we've got with all this extra genetic material. A new study published on May 12th in the journal Nature says that that stuff is just crap. It's nothing. Get it out of there. And their proof is in this plant, the carnivorous bladderwort. Looking at the DNA of the carnivorous bladderwort plant, scientists believe that they have confirmed that our junk DNA probably ain't worth the proteins it's printed on. The clues to this new finding has to do with the bladderwort's tiny amount of non-coding DNA. Whereas most things, including humans, have like 2% genes and 98% Zippo, that 1-2% to of DNA contains all the genes that make RNA that make you, you. That added up to about 20 to 25,000 genes. Our DNA is made up of base pairs, and most things have billions of them. For example, a lily has 40 billion base pairs, billion with a B, but the bladderwort, it has only around 80 million base pairs. A tiny amount in comparison, but if we look closer, they both, just like us, have only around 25,000 active genes. The same number of genes, but one has 500 times more base pairs? What the heck is going on with all that other stuff then? The scientists see it as just junk, waste. Scientists have no idea how, but this little carnivorous plant stripped a significant amount of the junk DNA out of its genome. The genes fit into this DNA comfortably with only about 3% junk. Humans are more like the lily. We've got something like 500 billion base pairs, with 98% of that being non-coding DNA or junk DNA. Why do we have it? 
no idea. Duke University's Greg Ray believes the non-coding DNA is sort of like a recipe book. Without it, the coding DNA wouldn't function properly, but that was prior to this new study. Ray believes that the non-coding DNA can be a factor in how we look and act, as well as genetic diseases that might affect us. But now with this discovery, he may just have to reassess. The more scientists seem to learn, the more confusing it becomes. And looking at this one plant and its strange ability to lose junk DNA may mean it's not important, but are we sure? Not even close. So, so obviously that's aimed at the young people. And it was a year after that uh, that study came out, and it was well known. So, two things: either the Discovery Channel, Nat Geo, Science, all of those channels that you love to watch and claim to be the latest and greatest uh, information, the the truth, are lying to you, or maybe they just don't know. So well, you 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 can make you can make the judgment yourself. So I, I came up with, a, that, that made me think of the word arrogant and stupid. <laughs> so I looked up arrogant. Having or revealing an exaggerated sense of one's own importance or abilities. You know, and we read in Romans, because although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were dark, and professing to be wise, they became fools. Okay, I think that called me out so it's really important now so we had all of this time where the people thought there was junk dna they weren't using they weren't looking finally in the encode project has released the the scientists to really focus and now they're finding tremendous tremendous advances in scientific medicine and one of them is, is this, uh, what your health care will look like in 20 years. They'll be taking DNA samples. They'll be looking at those areas of the DNA that the ENCODE project found. They're go, you know, it mentioned, if you flash briefly, uh, that Crohn's disease was one of the thing. All of these, you, you look at the young people nowadays, most of them are having uh, stomach and bowel problems. And, and you, you know, in, in my day and, and in probably most of your day, you don't remember any friends that had, you know, all of these irritable bowel syndrome and Crohn's disease and, and acid reflux and all of that stuff. Okay, but now because of the food we eat or, or the whatever, the, the deterioration in our genome, we're having those problems. And so now they will have clinical medicines that are targeted, focused. So you get, a, uh, you get a different medicine, you get a different medicine, you get a different medicine based on what you are as a different, slightly different parts of your DNA. And also in cancer research, they're, they're, you're not taking such a shotgun approach. Now you can focus in on trying to solve the problems. Once you have this kind of information, it focuses your attention like a laser beam onto the onto what needs to be done and so progress can be made so all of those years that we were talking about from the 70s on up to the 2000s up to 2012 we've been talking about junk dna and even discovery channel keeps talking about it it's just not true and so in summary for this first part i want to just say that evolution has hurt medicine through junk dna Belief in junk DNA has delayed the full understanding of DNA. The belief in evolution has delayed scientific treatment of sickle cell anemia, diabetes, and other hereditary diseases. And belief in evolution has delayed cancer research and cures based on DNA understanding. So that's how this belief in evolution translates to the harm that it's done to humans through the lack of progress in medicine that now we're just seeing starting. The other topic I wanted to cover was uh, vestigial organs. So if you follow along, a vestigial item is something that is not needed. It's extra. It's just a, it's a vestige of something that was uh, had a function in the past. So as we were evolving and say we were uh, monkeys, uh, we, we, we didn't need the tail. So our tail uh, shrank and shrank and shrank with monkeys. And then finally, the monkeys had no tails. So they look like humans. Their, their phys physiology changed. So they weren't knuckle draggers and walking on four legs, but they stood erect, et cetera, et cetera. So 
all of these ideas, and you, you'll remember yourself, as we went through that uh, depiction below, you can think that as, you know, just like the junk DNA, we had parts of the DNA that weren't useful. So maybe we have parts that were left over in our bodies that have no use. So let's play this last video. This is number four. So this is uh, Kent Hovid. Uh, he's going to talk to us about vestigial organs. This textbook says the appendix is vestigial. This is ludicrous, okay? This is a lie. The appendix is not vestigial. You do need your appendix, okay? The appendix is part of your immune system. It's true you can live without it. You can also live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes. That doesn't prove you don't need them, okay? If your appendix is taken out, you have a much better chance of getting quite a few diseases and something else, and the immune system has to work harder. It's like losing a finger. You can still have a grip, but now the rest of the fingers have to work harder. If somebody tells you the appendix is vestigial, they are either confused about their anatomy or they're lying to you, but it's not true. This textbook says the whale has a vestigial pelvis. This is one that he brought up earlier about the whale having a vestigial pelvis. Now, hold on a minute. Uh, National Center for Science Education, funded by Andrew Carnegie's grant, for, he loved the evolution theory. The National Center for Science Education, who all of them refused to debate me two weeks ago when I was at Berkeley. Um, they teach the people that cows evolve to whales, bossy to blowhole. Hmm. Well, here's their evidence. Whales have a vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose. Just imagine the uh, hind limb bones that have no function, the textbook says. Imagine whales walking around, it's true. Here's the bones they're talking about right there. You can see them at your Los Angeles Museum right down the road here. Those are the bones. Yes, just imagine the whale walking around. <laughs> this textbook says the whale's pelvis is located far from the vertebra and has no apparent function. Hmm. The whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. This is a lie. Those bones are anchor points that special muscles attach to. And without those special bones and those special muscles, the whales cannot reproduce. Male and female, whales have different bones in that region for to support different muscles for different reasons. This has nothing to do with walking on land. It has to do with getting baby whales. Okay? So the people that are writing this in the textbooks are either ignorant of whale anatomy or they're lying trying to push their theory. I hope they're just ignorant. That we can fix. If they're lying, they ought to get a different job picking peaches or changing tires. They got no business taking tax dollars to lie to the kids coming through their class. Says so these bones resemble those of other mammals, but they are weakly developed in the whale and have no apparent function. This is a college biology book. This guy ought to be fired. He doesn't understand his whale anatomy. They're teaching this stuff like it's some kind of fact. Is this a university to get educated or are you just getting indoctrinated in a theory? Okay. They say Ambulocetus, pictured here, is mostly imagination. The dark bones are the only ones actually found. Ambulocetus is not a, a missing link. Ambulocetus is just a few fragments of bone. How about uh, uh, B, uh, B. J. Stahl, vertebrate history, uh, Dover publisher, said the Basilosaurus is not an intermediate. He said uh, the archaeocetes uh, could not possibly have been ancestral to any of the modern whales. Pachycetus, shown here, all they found was one piece of a skull, a small piece of jaw, and a few teeth. That's enough to know it used to be a whale? You've got to be kidding. Now, here you are, Skeptic Magazine. Why aren't you skeptical of a claim like that? No pelvic bones were found, and little is known about the tail, but the authors are certain the feet were enormous. <laughs> As such, Ambulocetus re represents a critical intermediate. This is pure propaganda, okay? We could talk all day about the whale anatomy. He mentioned about the snake. I happen to have a 15 and a half foot python snake skin in my museum in Pensacola, Florida. If you look at the south end of that python, you will see it has two little bitty claws. Those claws are attached to little tiny bones going up inside the snake's body. That's a fact, okay? They have them. The textbook says these are rudimentary hind legs of a python snake. He mentioned that earlier, that the snake uh, pelvis is evidence for evolution. Look. Those little claws and those little bones have nothing to do with walking on land. The snakes use those claws in mating, okay? They don't have any arms, right? And they can't talk. <laughs> they can't talk and say, screw it over, honey, okay? This has nothing to do with walking on land. So the people that are saying the snake has a vestigial leg are ignorant of snake anatomy or are lying trying to push a theory off. Okay, but it's not true. They use those bones and those little muscles. This textbook says humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. It says the vestigial tailbone in humans is homologous to the functional tail of other primates. Thus, vestigial structures can be viewed as evidence for evolution. You can rewind the tape and see that's what he said in his opening comments. One of the evidences for evolution is vestigial structures. 
I would like to point out, Your Honor, vestigial structures is losing something, not gaining something. How can that be evidence for evolution? How did you get it to begin with? Secondly, the tailbone is not vestigial. One guy told me, he said, up at Berkeley, he said, I think the tailbone is vestigial. I said, well, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. Get your Gray's Anatomy. Now, if you believe the tailbone is vestigial, then I will pay to have yours removed. Okay? <laughs> Bend over. This textbook says the coccyx is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column that has no present function and is thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree-living ancestor. Either these authors are ignorant of anatomy or they're lying. I don't see another option. Okay? If you know of one, please let me know. But it's not true that they're vestigial. And even if there were vestigial structures, that is the opposite. He mentioned that the human eye is poor design because the blood vessels are in front of the rods and cones. Well, the fact of the matter is, we live in the air, okay? Air is a poor insulator for UV light. Your body's last defense against ultraviolet light is a layer of blood vessels in front of the retina to protect the rods and cones from UV light. Some people say octopus, one atheist I debated in New York, said octopus have a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. Ours are wired backwards, it's poor design. I said, well, sir, uh, octopus live in the water, <laughs> okay? Water blocks UV light. They don't need their blood vessels in front. So if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you just go ahead, but you're going to be blind in a few days. We're designed for living in the air, and they're designed for living in the water. And I think the eye is incredibly designed. At 51, mine are starting to fade a little bit, but hey, that's expected, okay? That's an example we used to be much better. Things are getting worse. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Things are falling apart. Um, let's see. He mentioned that uh, he, when he got through Pepperdine, he went to, off to graduate school and decided he got to think. To me, that implies that if you don't believe in evolution, you, you're not thinking. I, I happen to resent that. I happen to think a lot, and, and I enjoy thinking, and I enjoy the, the object of, uh, of I enjoy science. I like studying. I think what happens, though, is you get to get indoctrinated when you come to a university like this. You get to be told what to believe. You don't really get to think. Because if you wrote a paper, suppose a teacher stood up 10 years ago in the Soviet Union, where my daughter-in-law is from. A teacher gets up in class and says, hey, uh, students, I don't believe in communism anymore. Capitalism is a much better system. What, what would happen? That teacher would be shoveling snow in Siberia if they survived. And if a teacher gets up in this university tomorrow or Monday and says, kids, I don't believe in evolution anymore. I think creation is true. They will go to academic Siberia. There have been hundreds of teachers fired, lost their jobs, lost their government grants precisely because they didn't bow down and kiss the feet of the sacred cow of evolution. Evolution's a religion, nothing more. There is no scientific evidence to back it up. If you think there is some, I really, really would like to see it. He mentioned that the Pope accepts evolution. That's because the Pope has never been to my seminar. <laughs> And I don't care what the Pope believes on any subject, okay? I care what does the Bible say and what does science teach us? He mentioned in his opening comments that answers in Genesis, Ken Ham disagrees with me on most subjects. That is absolutely not true. I know Ken Ham well. I've uh, met, met with him several times, talked to him numerous times. He and I disagree on a couple of little things. We agree on 99% of the things, and on the other 1%, he's wrong, I'm right, but it's real simple. Okay? <laughs> But I sell his books and support his ministry, and I, I think you're simply wrong if you think there's, there's a vast disagreement there. Just little minor stuff that doesn't amount to nothing. Uh, he said, this argument's only going on in America and New Zealand. Well, that's not true, first of all. I've spoken in, let's see, 32 countries now. This argument's going on every place. There are creationist organizations all over the place. And even if it was only going on in America, it still does, that's, that's no evidence for one side or the other. The argument ought to be going on everywhere. And I'm thrilled this university would allow something like this to happen. I wonder how many teachers they have. How many courses did they offer here on biblical creationism just to give the, give the kids the other side? Go check your library. You'll find thousands of books about evolution. I bet you won't find five on creation from the creation perspective. You may find some evolutionist wrote a book about creation, blasting it for some reason. Coach, folks, is this an education to get, do you get educated or do you get indoctrinated in places like this? I just, I'm sick and tired of them lying to support their theory. Don't tell me about the vestigial structures. What evidence do you have to show us evolution? 
Not homology. Similar bone structures in the arms they mentioned earlier. Yeah, that proves a common designer. The Honda Prelude and the Honda Accord have quite a few interchangeable parts. <laughs> Doesn't prove they both came from a skateboard. They have a common designer, OK? <laughs> so all the evidence I've seen he's presented tonight is either mistaken or can be interpreted for creation. So I, I stand my ground. I still believe the Bible's right. Thank you. So just to reiterate on, the, on a couple of the things that he mentioned. So belief in vestigial organs is harm medical science by removal rather than treatment of tonsils and appendixes when infected. So when I was a youngster, you know, if you had a tonsil, it's called tonsillectomy, they cut out the tonsils. So the tonsils actually are another uh, part of the immune system. They actually perform the function of, of the, they filter bacteria and viruses as it goes through the mouth and it prevents you from getting sick. So again, you can live without them, but it just makes your immune system work harder and you're more susceptible to diseases. Also, the appendix, that little tag on the end of your, uh, your, your system there, acts as a storehouse for good bacteria. So if you have an event where you're, your bowels are uh, being challenged with the diarrhea, then that appendix has the good bacteria and re-injects it back into your system so that you uh, re retain your health. You need to have those, those good bacteria. And so that was the storehouse for it. And as he said, the coccyx, that little bone at the end of your spine, that's where those muscles attach that do those functions that we all appreciate every day. <laughs> So just in summary, the last, uh, last bit on this uh, vestigial organ, I think that evolution has harmed people through damaging surgeries. Belief in evolution has prevented identification of the important functions of the tailbone, the appendix, and the tonsils. Belief in evolution has allowed surgeries that weaken people's immune system through extraction of tonsils and appendixes. And belief in evolution has slowed advances in prevention and optimization of human health. So I think those two examples, the junk DNA and the vestigial organs, those are, those are fundamental to evolution. He was the last speaker, uh, Kent Hovind, he was debating another person who had talked before he had, and he was referring back to his speech of referring to the junk DNA and to the vestigial organs as being representative of, uh, uh, of the importance of evolution over creation. And so we have to take this into account when we're doing our thinking, we need to think critically as, as Christians, we have to have critical thinking and look into things. And you know, I understand that most people are in this room or maybe some of the people aren't really interested that much in science, but I know that if you go online and you go to the major uh, creation sites like Institute of Creation Research, uh, Answers in Genesis, and creation.com, and you type in your questions in the little box at the top, you'll get tons of information, and it's written in a friendly format, so you don't need to be a PhD to understand it. It's written to anybody uh, with good education, you know, can understand what's going on. So... In conclusion, I think all glory goes to God. It's just amazing how complex we, as human beings, are very arrogant. We think we, we find something. It's like uh, um, Archimedes when he was taking the bath and he was trying to figure out how to measure volumes of, of irregularly shaped objects. And so his bathtub was full and he climbed in and, and the water spilled all over the floor. And he says, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm displacing that water. So if I measure how much water was displaced, I can measure what my volume is. And he jumped out of the tub. And unfortunately, he didn't take a towel with him and ran through the streets yelling, Eureka, I found it. So each one of us, you know, and he was probably fairly embarrassed when he got far enough away and people started pointing at him and laughing. So we have to look at the scientists and see, is that Archimedes running through the streets naked, thinking, Eureka, I found it, and they've only found a small portion of what God has given. But I tell my, stu my students, studying science is a, is, a, is a blessing. You know, being allowed to think God's thoughts after him, to see how intricate in every 
possible way that even the simplest structure is, even that uh, carnivorous bladder warp, although it was used to try to, to uh, prove evolution and junk DNA, it has, a, it has a purpose, and God put every creature on earth, and I tell the kids, it's a blessing to learn science. If that's what you, if you enjoy doing, follow your heart, become a scientist, and speak up. You know, tell the truth and, and let people know what the your true findings are with regard to these sacred cows of, of evolution of the junk DNA and vestigial organs and on and on. So I thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed what we saw today, and uh, we'll do it again next week. Next week, we're going to be covering uh, the the harm that's been done to people more on a personal level, not, not the mass... Uh, uh, Holocaust that we talked about last week, but this this next week, what what on a personal level, what happens when you really follow evolution to its conclusion? And so I thank you very much.